The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Listeners, this is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with episode twelve of Viewpoint, the return to our original format. Um, and I'm here, um, I'm here with our producer and director of programming for BaseNet Internet Television, Ed Jupin. Ed, how are you tonight? Welcome back. It feels like we've been away, huh? The only it, thing different between this uh, return to Viewpoint and the original Viewpoint is your original co-host Michael Dow is no longer with us. But hopefully, true. in the next few weeks, we can get somebody. That is true. We are actively seeking a new co-host who can go round for round with me discussing a lot of the issues today. So if you are interested in being a co-host, even if it's just a guest co-host, a guest spot on Viewpoint, not a recurring role, you can email us at viewpoint at basenettv.com. And just to let all the listeners know out there, remember our website is basenettv.com, basenettv.com. We have consolidated, because we are brilliant like that, all of our social media into just BaseNet TV. So whether you're on Google+, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on the Twitter, wherever you are, BaseNet TV is there, and we're under just BaseNet TV. Pretty soon I'm going to be coming out with my own Facebook. It's going to be called Tony Book. I'm going to run with it for a while just to get that IPO going, get my couple millions, and then you know bounce out of there. But we'll be BaseNet TV on Tony Book as well. And, and, and it's going to be different from Facebook. It's not going to be all these other people. It's going to be basically everyone as they relate to me. Well, you might have some competition with the lobster because I think he's going to start lobster book. <laughs> lobster book. No, no, no. Just a Tony book. But I'll, I'll allow BaseNet TV on there as uh, BaseNet TV. And I just want to remind everyone before we get into show, today's regular format show, and for those new listeners, I'll explain what that means in a minute. We do still need and accept and love donations here at BaseNet TV through the end of June, excuse me, through the beginning of June. If you go to basenettv.com and click on the donations tab and donate to us at here at BaseNet, 20% of all donations we are going to give directly to the Jimmy Fund through the first week of June, and that'll all get announced and tallied at their scoopable, something great that they do every year. But again, any donations you give to BaseNet between now and the first week of June, we will absolutely be forwarding to 20% of that to the Jimmy Fund through the first week of June. So without further ado, the return to our regular format. When we began Viewpoint 12 episodes ago, back in the uh, the summer when the weather was almost as warm as it is now, if not maybe warmer, we had originally started doing mainly a politics and in the news show. And then as the campaign of the primary season swung into full gear grip, we switched to cover that and bringing that coverage. But we like to be a step ahead of the game. We like to beat the mainstream media in their own game. So now that the primary season has ended, for all intents and purposes, we're switching back to our regular format covering general news, everything that's going on in the country and in the world, and a lot of the, the election updates will still come, but much more general news. And I'm sure as we get closer to the general election, there will be more and more, and we'll still have our updates. But we're generally focusing on our t traditional in-the-news style format, going back and forth over these issues, talking about them, trying to get behind what the mainstream media and what the pundits on both sides are saying about them, to really get to the core of what's going on here and where the real problems lie, what the real issues with some of these news art stories are, and what they really mean for us here in this country and around the world. So without further ado, we're going to move into our in the news section today. And the first thing we're going to talk about, this has been all over the news. And I sometimes don't like to pick up on stuff that's been all over the news, but I've got some interesting points on this that I want to talk about. And Ed, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on it. The title of the article, I believe this comes from Fox News, is Lawmakers Slam GSA Officials for South Pacific Trips at Second Day of Hearings. So the background story for anyone who hasn't been able to, who hasn't had a chance to follow this, who hasn't had a chance to look at it, the GSA, which for those of you who don't know, is the ultimate bureaucratic institution in this country, the General Services Administration, a branch of the federal government, their officials had hosted, I believe it was last year in Las Vegas, a big convention, cost taxpayers over $800,000, and it wasn't just the cost of the convention, it was the deluxe suites that a lot of their senior management were housed in, it was the expensive breakfasts, it was, uh, there was a $75,000 bicycle team building event, all this waste that people just can't imagine. It went deeper, there were a couple hundred iPods supposed to be given out as prizes, and 115 of them went missing, but miraculously, this guy that headed up the GSA, who keeps pleading the fifth, his daughter supposedly had one. Uh, again, coming from the news story, don't know whether or not that's founded or not. So a big controversy. 
And There's the just second- nothing new about this. I was talking with one of our production assistants at BaseNet today, and this just ties into the story that stories that I've been hearing my entire life about the $500 hammers, for instance, that the government will buy, that you could buy for $5 at Sears, and see craftsmen from Sears, and they are not an advertiser of us, so this is a free shameless plug for Sears, <laughs> they give you a free lifetime warranty. So you buy this stinking $5 hammer from Sears, you get a lifetime warranty with it. That same hammer through the GSA is 500 bucks. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and, and that's going to get to the key, I'm, I'm going to get into a minute, of where the problem with this really is. You're right. Government excess always happens. People are doing dumb stuff and it happens. Is this wrong? Of course it is. I mean, at a time when the country is suffering and the world is suffering and don't anyone out there tell me we're not suffering. This is lavish spending. Now, other episodes of Viewpoint, I've always made the point when you talk about the First Lady's vacations, are they lavish? And I always sort of float in the middle well, on that one. We've given it to them. We've, we've said, look, right. it goes with the territory and with the job. So exactly. It goes with the territory, goes with, with the it. job. Now, the GSA may need to hold a convention, and it may need that they need to rent out 2,000 hotel rooms, whatever it is. I understand that, the size of the organization, but the problem then comes that they're having a $75,000 bicycle building team breaking, team, team breaking event, team building event. There's this guy, the head of the GSA, and you know, some of these rooms they got at the government rate and whatnot, but I'll tell you, a big suite in Vegas at the government rate is probably still pretty expensive. Now, the, they're getting some of these rooms at the government, uh, the government rate, some of these uh, catering events they had, $50 ahead breakfast. Now, I'll tell you, catering is very expensive. Anywhere you get catering done, it's very expensive. Especially but, if you're there. Oh, absolutely, especially if I'm there. I'm always factored in as a head count of three or four. In particular, $50 ahead, though, is on the high end for catering. $50 ahead is what a very nice wedding would have catered for a brunch. You could have gone with the twenty dollar a head option for juice. Yeah, and I'll, I'll cater anything for ten bucks a head. Yeah, exactly. And you'll you know, still I, get a decent deal. A couple of years ago, I, uh, I had a couple of friends of mine who were planning a wedding, and their wedding was this past summer, and it was wonderful. They were complaining about the costs, and I'm like, and they're like, oh, you know, the catering, it's it's a hundred dollars a head or some obscure number. And I'm like, oh, listen, I'm like, you let me do the catering, I'm like, fifteen bucks a person. You'll absolutely, I'll I'll get you an ice cream cake and some hot dogs, and there you go, ten bucks. Uh, absolutely, you know, I. Uh, and who wouldn't the... like ice cream cake and hot dogs? So exactly, fun. you know, a lot of the civic groups I I, I work with, you know, will do meals and. We do them on the cheap, and we're able to get a good meal out there, 10, 12 bucks a head. So maybe BaseNet should start its own catering company, uh, the, the Viewpoint Catering Arm of the BaseNet Media Empire. Well, if people don't start donating soon, we're going to have to try that. <laughs> We're going to have to do something to, to drum up the revenue. They definitely could have picked lower-cost options. They should have looked at it and said, how is this going to look on the front page of the news if people find out we spent seventy-five grand on a friggin' bike? Uh, bike building exercise. Team building exercise where they built a bike. Sorry, I keep getting confused. But what I really want to get here, and this this article in particular references that now there was a 17-day trip that this guy, the former head of the GSA or, or underhead, whatever underling he was, took with his wife. Uh, there were nine pre-planning trips to Vegas. There was a 17-day trip that took him to Guam, Hawaii, and Saipan. Don't really know why or what the deal is. You know, there are allegations, him and his wife texting back and forth. And by the way, you got to love social media here. Because the pictures of this guy sitting in a tub in this really swanky suite with the wine glasses and the stupid smile on his face, somebody pulled those from his wife's Google Plus page. <laughs> Absolutely love social media for that. Any harm social media has done to society to this day was completely reversed and paid back tenfold <laughs> by the someone going on to this lady's Google Plus page and pulling those out. Absolutely wonderful that they did that. But we all know what this is. We don't need to go into the details and figure out every dollar we spent. Corruption happens, et cetera, et cetera. But where the real problem is, where I fault the federal government itself more than the GSA, and probably the politicians more than the GSA, is for horrible oversight controls, horrible cash control systems. Yes, an inspector general's report found out about this a year or so later, six months later, nine months later, whatever it happened to be. But you shouldn't have to wait until an inspector general's report comes back to figure this out. Now, Ed, you and I and a lot of people out there and listeners have worked jobs at that entry level. You'll realize that McDonald's knows how much they're supposed to have in the till at the end of the day. McDonald's knows how much they're supposed to be spending, and they don't let people spend money. 
there's very strict control measures out there in the private sector for people spending money. It needs to get approval going up to certain levels. People who run multi-million dollar operations in the oh, private give sector. You, yeah, people that run multi-million dollar companies in the private sector will give you a $50 petty cash to work with. Exactly. If and you, you need what? pens, paper, ink cartridges, well, you're doing that with a $50 petty cash. Well, a freaking ink weekly. cartridge costs more than 50 bucks. They, they, you're submitting weekly, absolutely. People who run 10, 20, 30 million dollar businesses or, or elements of businesses are told that they can't spend more than 500 or 1,000 dollars without authorization on necessary stuff. So why is it that the private sector is able to put in these control measures where somebody is looking at these bills? There's some sort of an approval system where somebody's saying, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Because if you're telling me that all the way through up these levels, all these huge expenses get approved, nobody at some point stopped to say, wait a minute, what are we sending? You, The federal government has the resources, especially the GSA, to put the head, the very head of the GSA, to go onto her computer, and she stepped down, and click whether she approves or disapproves funding anything that costs, mm. that's a non-payroll cost, over $10,000. Why shouldn't she be approving it? Why shouldn't the people at the head of government be approving all these costs? Yes, I know it's massive. The GSA is huge. But have some sort of a system where somebody is saying, I know what this is and I'm approving it above this level. You know what I mean? This $75,000 bike building exercise, I would like to know who approved that, what the process was where somebody checked it off. In what level of government are they at that they're okay and they have the ability to approve a $75,000 expense, budgeted or not? It doesn't matter if Congress gave you this money. You can't just say, hey, Congress gave the GSA $100 billion this year, $100 million this year. We can spend it how we want. It's the control measures, and it's a problem that they're not in the place. And again, it, it's terrible. Your average McDonald's manager runs a million or $2 million business, and you're right, probably can't spend more than $50 without approval. And God forbid his payroll is off $100 at the end of the week. He's oh, getting yeah. something screamed at him. Sure. You know, and this is one of those cases where we absolutely do need to borrow from the private uh, from the private sector. How is it that we spend all this money, all this oversight, and nobody knows what's going on? A theory I've advanced for before here and at BaseNet, uh, here it, on Viewpoint and elsewhere, and I've shared this with you, Ed, and I think a few other uh, colleagues of mine, is that when you talk about the national debt, for instance, the federal government holds, this country holds really, so much debt, and the budget is so big that nobody has a real concept of these ideas anymore, of, of how much money this is. It's all just fake because it's so much money. These people in the GSA are all of a sudden spending amounts of money multiple times their salaries. And the thing that always bothers me about it, people say something's not a lot of money. My expression, my response to that is always, well, then lend me that money. Well, you know what? But it isn't real money anyway. This goes to the Ron Paul theory of wanting to redo the monetary system. Our, you know, our dollar is not backed by anything right now. It's just, it's just printed as needed. Yeah, that's true. So it absolutely is technically not real money. It just has value because we're all pretending to continue to say it has that value. But, you know, somebody approves a $75,000 bike big building exercise. If you think that's so valuable, would you be willing to sacrifice your salary and leave your job for that to happen? And the answer is no. Is it worth your job for something like that to happen? And the answer should always be no. I always used to pose that to managers that worked for me, and I always had that question posed to me. If you're going to make this expense, it's X percentage of your salary. If this went bust, would you feel that it was worth it to mm -hmm. the point that we would then take it out you of your off? salary, right? Exactly. And you know, a lot of times I would say, absolutely, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to take mm -hmm. the chance. Not that the government should be taking risks the way the private sector does, but yes, I think this is valuable. I'm willing to spend $45,000 to get a roof replaced because it's gonna allow us to operate another couple of years. That's a yep. you know, that's a relative estimate. These people in let me tell you that the top federal salary for most people, even the senior executive service, for the most part, they're not making more than 160 or 190 grand mm -hmm. a year. So these people are proving this money, are approving what might be their whole salary, more than their salary, twice their salary, whatever it happens to be. Even if you're making 180, 190 grand a year, you're just gonna approve a seventy-five thousand dollar. I mean, let's stop for a minute and think. Just say that one figure on this stupid bike building exercise. Everyone stop, take a breather, close your eyes, unless if you're listening to us on the road, then please don't. <laughs> $75,000 on a bike building exercise. Where did that get approved? Why, like, who, who's, who's authorizing stuff like this that the federal government doesn't notice this until a year later in a stupid inspector general's report? Not to mention nobody's got into the conference. Should they have had it? I'm not even getting into any of that. I don't even know what they were doing out there. I don't think any of the media outlets have reported on what the stupid conference was actually about, why they were there. I'm not really going to fault them on the $50 breakfast. I'm going to say who at what levels are approving these amounts. 
That's where the problem lies. That's where the bureaucratic inefficiency lies. This isn't a right wing, left wing spending, non spending thing. It's really about the fact that our government is inefficient in ways like this, very small, minute bureaucratic ways. Did somebody at the head of the GSA say, oh, you know, we want a buffet breakfast until the secretary. No, exactly. And, and other than the article that you're quoting this from, where was mainstream media on this? What happened to the transparency no, of the government? Nobody. I keep nobody hearing has... about how we're, our government is becoming more and more transparent. Where? You're telling me that no one in this whole thing, when this conference took place, no one thought this was so egregious that they'd alert the media. No one in this, the whole thing, no one said, I mean, this was not a little conference. This was not two executives took a very expensive weekend trip and nobody really knew about it. No one in this whole process said, oh my God, this is outrageous. They didn't. And I'll tell you why, because here's the other problem. One of them is an ineffective government. And I don't mean that in a right left sense of ineffective government. I mean, they're still operating like it's 60 years ago. People do not have character anymore. George Washington, the gentleman that he was, stated that what we choose public officials on should be based on their gentlemanly character. Is this an outstanding individual, civic-minded, a good, solid, honest person? And these people working for the GSA, and these people who saw this and didn't say anything, and I'm not saying all of them, if you're some number cruncher in an office in DC and you get told to go to a conference in, in Vegas and you, you show up in your coach flight, you go into your crappy room that you check into with your co-accountants, you attend a couple things and you go home. No, I maybe they wouldn't say anything. Maybe they don't know what's going on. But all of these people in government, and these are your bureaucrats, these are your public servants, if you want to call that, not a single one of them has an ounce of character. And that's a problem. When we, We've got to start saying that character counts in our country with individuals and especially with the government. Because let me tell you, the politicians, God knows they don't have it. So what about the people working behind the scenes that I'm supposed to feel bad for? That I'm supposed to feel like a jerk when I want to cut these people's health insurance contributions, when I want to cut their pay, and I'm supposed to look like a jerk. And you look at stuff like this and you say, where was the character? Where was there one good, honest person out of this whole lot of bastards? And you know what? They're going to lose their jobs, probably go on to consulting jobs, making two or three times what they were. Honestly, it pisses me off. And this is viewpoint, so we can say pisses off, that people get so angry about certain things in this country. They'll want to go chase down all these fake ghosts or whatever you want to call it, the, these fake news stories. But why doesn't somebody find out where this guy lives and go protest in front of his house? And I'm absolutely saying that on the air live. We should be protesting in front of this guy's house because he just wasted more money of your tax dollars than you'll probably make in the next 10 years. I don't even know what your salary would have to be to take home $175,000 a year. And this is just a bike building exercise. I, I mean, with the tax rate, that's got to be probably $130,000 or $140,000 a year salary for you to take home seventy five grand. Do you know what I'm saying? It's in, yep. When you factor in benefits, $75,000 could have gotten somebody a job for a year at forty or $45,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, when people are struggling for jobs, we're doing stuff like this. I'm sorry, I would love to travel to Hawaii and Saipan and Guam. I can't afford it. I can't remotely afford it. I couldn't even max out my credit card and afford it. That's how poor I am. But this guy did it for 17 days with his wife, drove all around. Again, where's the character? Where's our class? Where's the class in our public officials? Why aren't we finding out where this guy lives and protesting at his house? Go there at 3 o'clock in the morning. Blow a blow horn until the police come, whatever. They arrest you. They put it, put you away for civil disobedience. You probably get out 20 minutes later. Somebody else goes the next night. Make his life absolutely miserable. I'm all for nonviolence. I'm not saying anything violent. But show up at his house at 3 o'clock in the morning. Terrorize him by screaming at him and yelling at him and waking him up in the middle of the night. Send him a million emails. Mail a million empty packages to his house. Do everything you can to make this guy regret what he did. Because let me tell you something. 200 years ago in this country... When a politician or a public official did something like this, we'd tar and feather them. And I wish it was legal today because that's how you're going to get people like this to stop doing shit like this. I'll say this right now on the air. People in government should be afraid of their citizens in a nonviolent sense, I'm not advocating any violence here, but his life should be so miserable after this event that anyone else in a situation like this is going to stop and say, hey, you remember what happened to that guy at the GSA? He had to move 15 times before people finally <laughs> let his family at rest because they're a bunch of bastards just like he is. 
and then that might get them to stop doing it because that's not what's going to happen. He's in whatever high-powered apartment complex he's in right now or his house or whatever. He's going to show up to these hearings. Nothing's going to happen. He's going to go be a consultant somewhere. End of story. That's where we need to stop stuff like this from happening in America. Now, we're going to move into our – what's that? What a waste. It absolutely is. It's just it's just disgusting. I mean, I, I know one of the representatives from South Carolina really tore into the guy, and I hope he feels that anger. But he's not going to feel it until we find out where this guy lives, call his cell phone, mail, do every kind of nonviolent, civil disobedient thing he can, even if it leads you to get arrested. Again, get 50 people together to drive to his house and wake him up in the middle of the night. You see him running to work or driving to his trial, wherever he's going, <laughs> run after him, scream at him, call him names moon him flash him do whatever you can do to make this guy hate his life and do it to his wife too because she's just as dirty of a scumbag as he is these people should be miserable for the rest of their lives for what they did and that's how we're going to get people to stop doing this is when people in this government elected officials and appointed officials start actually having consequences for their actions beyond having to resign or possibly being fired and they're probably getting fired with severance packages i don't even want to go into it but I guess I'll give the Inspector General's office some kudos eventually uncovering this, although it's not necessarily their fault. It's not their responsibility to uncover it as it happens. This is just a joke, and it's a shame is what it is. This is America, ladies and gentlemen. This is the country we've been fighting and dying for for 200 years, and this is what it is. I think that's a shame. We're going to move on to the next – before we go to the next article, we're going to talk – which is another scandal. I mean they're just everywhere. <laughs> but I also – there was an article in the news today – about Leon Panetta regretting his regular trips to California and the cost they bear to taxpayers. Now, well, I don't know that's if, just the opposite of your first story. Well, it is. And I don't know if this came out regularly. Or I don't know if this came out just because of it, because he's ex- pre-expecting a public backlash. I remember reading about this several months ago. And Panetta was worried, and there was some controversy about him flying back and forth so often to California. He's an older guy. He's in his early 70s. He's 70 or 71. My biggest concern with it is, is two, well, there's two of them. On the one hand, do we want public officials like the Secretary of Defense, high-level officials, the highest level of our government, living everywhere and sort of just commuting into D.C. for a couple days and heading home? I don't like the idea of that. It should be a full-time occupation, and it is. He's not going home and just partying for three days and not paying attention to what goes on in the office until Monday. He's absolutely not, and I know that. But I wouldn't want everyone to do that. I wouldn't want them to think they don't have to move to D.C., to serve in the cabinet, and I don't want it to set a trend. That being said, he's entitled. Well, aren't even members of Congress not currently a full-time job yet? Let's say that again. Members of Congress, that's still not a full-time job, is it? Oh no, it's not. And I mean, they have a responsibility to spend time in their district. What they do in D.C., who only knows? But I guess I'm. I have far less of a problem with Leon Panetta flying home to California on the weekends. Again, spending time with family is important. Staying grounded is important. He's done what he can do to mitigate some of the costs. And I mean, he's doing what he He is the Secretary of Defense. And I understand that. Again, should he receive benefits that other people don't receive? Well, yeah, he is the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, well, we back a half a dozen episodes or so ago, we even gave Chris Christie of New Jersey a pass for when he was being criticized of taking the state police helicopter to get to his son's soccer game or whatever. Right. I mean, and you would said at that point, he is the governor of New Jersey and he's entitled to some perks. He is. And you know, again, Leon Panetta, even if you were to take a week or two weeks vacation, he's never really on vacation in a job like that, especially secretary of defense. Now I don't want to knock, I think Ken Salazar is the secretary of the interior right now, or that could have been 10 years ago. I tend to get them all confused. Well, that's still not defense. Yeah. um, But secretary of interior, he could probably go away for a couple of weeks, and as long as there's no major national catastrophe, he's probably not going to be needed. But the Secretary of Defense has a very tough job. I give this one a pass. I'm going to go with it. Officially, Viewpoint gives him a pass. It's expensive. I understand it. But part of the expense is because he's the Secretary of Defense. If he was any other official, or not at that level, obviously, but if he was a lower official, the expense would be less. We have to send him in a special jet. We have to spend him with you know, the, the, the communications equipment. And Again, has- the same discussion with the first lady. It's, it's all of these either cabinet-level positions thing. They're entitled to the perks of the office. They're, they're right. And I mean, he, it's not like he's using the, defense, the Department of Defense jet to fly 40 different places for vacations, and that's not a knock at Michelle Obama. I understand that. You know, he's not doing that. He's not flying to meet his, meet his wife in Paris for a weekend just to hang out. He's going back home to his family walnut farm in California. So I understand that. I'm willing to give it a pass. So 
we've got to can't look at these issues and we can't lump we can't lump things like that in with stuff this awful stuff at the awful stuff sorry at the GSA. But I wanted to bring up that Panetta story because I know it's a, a recurring theme here on Viewpoint and an interesting topic and a side note I guess to take away from the the viciousness with which we, we attack the GSA. Which by the way, so I heard anecdotally a story somebody who works for the GSA a friend of mine asked him what the GSA does and what he does with the GSA and he goes. Well, what I do or, or what our part of it does is in the event if there was ever a national disaster or a terrorist attack, we find office space for government agencies. <laughs> so we can't balance the budget, but we're preparing to find office space in the event of a uh, terrorist attack. I guess that's a good thing. Next article on the news. What's going on in our world today? Uh, prostitution scandal ricochets through Washington by Julie Page of the Associated Press. Something tells me you've all heard about this story as well. Oh, that's the big one. Yep. The president was in Colombia preparing for the Summit of the Americas. Several, I believe 10 was the number, but you never hear the right number with these things. The Secret Service agents were sent home because of a scandal involving prostitutes. Now, what's interesting about this story, before we get into it, before we analyze it, as we usually do here on Viewpoint, is the fact that the story broke and it was agents sent home for involvement with prostitutes. Some kind of a scandal. Nobody knows what's going on. And it went like that for a day, and it became a big controversy before anyone really knew how this came about or where it came about. Later, what apparently came about is that some of these men had gone to a brothel, and there had been some disagreement over a bill, something like that, a charge. And then the local police were called. The police called the embassy. The embassy called, which, by the way, side note here. Love that the police called the embassy first and foremost, which should happen. I mean, these these are, you know, Secret Service agents. These are how things work at that level of government. But later on, I was reading one article where it said that the Colombian police had been instructed by the U.S. Embassy not to answer questions on this incident. And I just found it funny that the Colombian police just accepted that. Again, it's a diplomatic nicety. There's a very close relationship between the two countries. We've given Colombia a lot of money. We've helped them root out a lot of the drug insurgency problem there. It's now in Mexico, which is probably worse for us, but that's another episode on another day. I guess this, too, is, is disheartening. It's disenfranchising. I don't know what the security concerns were. I don't know what security breaches they were. If I was President Obama and there were real legitimate security breaches, again, there were, there were supposedly some of these prostitutes were in the room and his schedule was there and all that. If I was him, I would be livid. I would be livid anyway because they're embarrassing you. I mean, it's like taking your children on a trip somewhere and they embarrass you. And the Secret Service, which has always held the highest regard in this country, we've always felt very comfortable with them, very safe. They're always thought of with a lot of respect. And they pull a stunt like this for the security lapses and for the embarrassment to do this when you're protecting the president of the United States at a big summit. I would be furious. This is absolutely embarrassing. This is not who we should try to be as a country. Now, these guys, I don't know, prostitution, I believe, is legal in Colombia, or it's one of those countries where it sort of is, sort of isn't. Do you fault them for doing something legal in the country on their time off? Right, sure. and I was going to say, even in this country, it's legal in a couple areas, mostly within the state of Nevada. Yep. And again, whether it's legal or illegal, or right or wrong, you don't do it, certainly if you're on duty or if you're within couple of your shifts or something of protecting the president thing if you're off and you've got a week off thing you know what what you do with your private life and that's out of the media and public's eye well if you want to go visit with prostitutes go visit with prostitutes i guess right and you but know i'm, gonna, I'm gonna... the time and a place for it then because we we can't just say it's illegal because even in, within the 48 continuous states of the united states it's not illegal in every state so you know, you can't just say it's illegal and it shouldn't be done. Okay, well, but there's a time and a place for it, though. Right, and then they, they created a controversy. Like, I guess that's something that I, I was reading one of these articles, and someone said that these prostitutes range up to a couple hundred dollars for the higher-end ones in Colombia, and there was a dispute over the bill. I mean, short of somebody, you expecting the bill to be $150 and it's $6,000, if I was a Secret Service agent, I would have just paid the bill. I mean, I, could, I guess I, I could, could you Could you imagine seeing this? knock on the door and this groggy guy comes to the door yeah hey uh barry i i mean uh mr president uh, you, you got a couple hundred bucks i could borrow i'm a little short i got this bill i have to pay <laughs> i mean maybe we need to pay them more so that they don't have to fight it but i mean you'd think if you were a secret service agent you wouldn't want this kind of here's the thing 
employed by virtually any government agency, I don't think I would ever visit a prostitute while working on that yep. government while agency. Or working on the agency, right. Why would you want to put yourself at that risk? But especially, I mean, it's a dispute of $100, if $50. If it's a low amount like that, just pay it so there's not a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and again, who knows what they were doing, whether they went back to the hotel rooms. But I just, I guess this story is disappointing more than anything. The first story, what's going on with the GSA, I mean, that's disgusting. This well, that's just... where the term hush money came from. You know, in a case like this, you instead of paying the $200 tab, you pay $2,000 just to shut it up and keep it away from the media and all. Right, and apparently nobody felt that that was yeah, necessary. You know, wasn't worth their extra money, and these guys are going to kick themselves in the ass because they're going to lose their jobs, and they're not at a high enough level. I mean, they'll probably go work for Blackwater or something like that. Yeah. But again, I just you know it is a scandal. I will I will say one thing. I don't hold the president personally responsible for this. You no, know, absolutely GSA, not. The GSA thing, it sort of happened under his watch. This is different. I, I, I don't know why I'm conceptually I look at it as different. Well, but, you can't be responsible for every every government employee out there. Right, that's true. And I mean, how often does the president honestly think he's going to worry about his own private security team? And, yeah. and it was I mean, I've just... got news for you. The town that you currently live in, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm just throwing a number out there. There's going to be at least one police officer on the police department of the town you're living in right now that's corrupt or bad. It's going to happen. Right, absolutely. You're going to get one out of every bunch. Right, but you know, you never expect it with the Secret Service. I guess that—that's. Oh, maybe I, you don't expect it, but yeah, I do expect it. <laughs> well, I mean, there were so many of them that apparently, you know, were, were partaking in this. And again, this is going to sound awful, but if they were down there protecting a presidential candidate, some low-grade senator, or right. you know, yeah, exactly, a deputy U.S. ambassador to Colombia for friggin' shoe trade exchange i'll let them go whatever they were kind of just having a good time they're not really protecting anyone important as awful as that sounds but come on guys you you've disappointed your country and you've caused us to lose faith in one of the few institutions that we had never really lost faith in prior to this there was an article also or attached to some of these that some military members would have been were involved or, or something similar but then that seemed to have gotten retracted again call me a jerk call me an, uh, an anti-feminist but yeah, you're in the military. It's a little bit more acceptable. I mean, yeah, you're protecting the country, but there's a little bit of a history and tradition there, so to speak. But this, even though they were working for the president, but the Secret Service, I was very disappointed about this. Again, we've hit two issues that shouldn't be right-left issues. I think everyone should be disappointed by this. Not holding the president personally responsible in any way, shape, or form. But shame on those Secret Service agents for for really blackening their profession and giving their agency a black eye. I mean, the General Services Administration, I don't think anyone cares about to begin with. But we're moving from scandals into our next news story before we go to our election updates, and it is Fort Worth to consider hiring only non-smokers. The city of Fort Worth, Texas, had a contest about a year or two ago for employee-sponsored ideas and people won some money, and this is an idea that the city manager in Fort Worth is looking into and is going to submit a proposal of some sort to the city council in the next week or two. It's a thought that it might save the city millions of dollars in their health care costs and in healthier, more productive employees. Okay, all... before you move on with your topic then, yep. last time I checked, mm-hmm. it's not illegal to smoke in this country, cigarettes. Correct. I just don't see how it could be legal or constitutional to not hire smokers. It is not an illegal act. This is this is true, and I agree with you. And I somewhat and I'm not question. a smoker, right? But, I, but I I will stick up for smokers' rights to an extent until the day that it becomes illegal. My guess, and I could be wrong here. This is just my guess. The way they'll approach it, and we'll get into the healthcare costs all in a minute, will probably be that it is a clinically proven detriment to an individual's health, and it does not allow you to operate at the optimal level needed to work for the city of Fort Worth. That could be how they approach it, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to defend that answer because I don't really know if that's the case. Because you're right, I do question how they can, you know, with the legal ramifications. You know, that's but so out there. You know, I mean, that's that's a very good explanation you just gave, and yeah, I'll buy into that. But that being said, that's so out there. Other than the ridiculous Ninth Circuit, and we call it ridiculous all the time on as we see it. If you guys want to go back and listen to the previous 38 episodes of as we say it (laughs) you'll hear a slam the ninth circuit court of appeals which is out of northern california constantly Uh, and so unless it goes through the ninth circuit nobody else is ever going to let something like that fly well but here's another way they could approach it 
One of the problems with health insurance in this country, and we're not going to get into the health insurance debate, but at a very basic level, health insurance doesn't work like regular insurance. Now, regular insurance, if I drive a car, there's a estimate on how much damage I can cause to myself, to other people, to the car, et cetera. And it's based on how much I, how, how my driving record is really, and the value of the car and all that, and you know, age and some other factors. So that if I get into two or three accidents a year, I'm paying an extraordinary amount of money for my car insurance. Now, health insurance, if it were unfortunately to work that way, you'd have people getting disqualified, which just happens for pre-existing conditions. I mean, you wouldn't want somebody to say, oh, I just had a heart attack. Oh, well, now your health insurance is going to double or triple. But everyone pays the same for health insurance when you're attached to a group plan. So, and it might differ union by union, but I mean, you know, all the firefighters in the city of Fort Worth are going to be paying that same biweekly deduction for their health care insurance. However, if any of them are smokers, it is scientifically proven beyond any doubt that they cause higher health care costs to the organization, to the plan, and to the country. So another way the city of Fort Worth could do this, if they were to get struck down and say that you're not allowed to ban smokers, so to speak, and I'll give you another reason why they Boy, I, I don't know. You know, I but, guess, okay, you know, you don't need a co-host because I'm going to dispute you a lot today. Smoking, hold on, let me just finish real quick, though. But smoking's been going on forever. Now right. all of a sudden... There's another way that they that, can get away... I'm going to give you real quick, Ed, I'll just give you a quick way they can get around this. Because you're a smoker, you have a higher health insurance cost. They could easily call their health insurance company, and again, I'm not sure the legality of this, but they call their health insurance company, and they say, hey, health insurance company... Start charging smokers an extra 50 bucks a week, which is something I happen to support, by the way, unrelated to this. And then maybe people will say, gee, if I work for the city of Fort Worth, I've got to pay a lot more as a smoker than as a non-smoker. We're not going to get into the argument over obesity. If people want to get into that, my agreement, my argument on that is, sure, do the same thing. But that's another way that they could go about doing that. A third way that they could get around this because again i i will at least agree with you i'm not sure how you legally cannot hire somebody for i don't know you're sounding awful socialistic to me tonight well but personally in, in full disclosure i hate smoking with such a passion but more than that i hate the cost it has to the economy because let me tell you right now smoking in, in the disease that leads to the cost to our health care it is far worse than all the illegal drugs that we fight about combined I mean, the disease that smoking causes, the number of cancers it causes, and the cost to our healthcare system is more than what drugs costs us. And I'm talking about the bad ones, your heroin, your crack, your meth, and all that. Then why, isn't, why aren't tobacco products just made illegal? For the love of God, I don't know. I literally— Well, like, see, that's, that's my argument. Plain and simple. If it's not illegal, I don't think you could turn this into a— socialistic type government where but hold on here's where, here's, where you're going to say a, you can't do this another, this this here, and this because yeah, we'll it's legal then make the damn things illegal then right and maybe they're, they're going to probably eventually get to that or or, or a tax out of existence but here's another example does anyone know how they made smoking illegal in restaurants in massachusetts and most other states they didn't just say it's illegal to smoke because you know smoking is bad it was about employee health mm-hmm and that's how they said an employee has a responsibility or a right, whatever, right. to work to, in a safe To not be breathing all of that smoke. Exactly. Now, they could turn around and use two arguments. And again, they're a little weak, but if it goes to the court, the court might accept it. They could say, well, wait a minute now. Smokers have – smokers are more likely to cause problems or, or be ineffective at work or, or you know, there's all these health things associated with it. We can't do it because it's not fair to the other employees. That's one possible avenue. And they'd have to flesh that out better than I am. The other one is – they could end up talking about smells and people's smell sensitivity and stuff like that because that's very big nowadays. People, they, they, There's a word for it. It's not smell sensitivity, but like it's people who, who basically they're oversensitive to smells and and, mm -hmm. and they, they can't – they don't like – like there's some – Well, that's a good layman's way to describe it. There is. Yeah. There's, a, there's a word for it. Somebody will have to email me and let me know what it is. But there are workplaces out there that are starting to have to ban perfume and cologne because people have right. these, these smell sensitivities. And it could be the same thing with smoking, that smoking always leaves a smell – for the most part, on the smoker. And as such, you can't smoke here in the city because people have smell sensitivities. I wish I could come up with the right mm -hmm. word. For no, it. but that's a good that's, way to describe it, it though. That's what it is. And, and, you know, so there's a lot of different things that they could do here. And the final thing that they might be able to do is if they could turn around and if their health insurance company says, 
hey, you know, and, and I can't, I don't know what Dallas Fort Worth or what Fort Worth spends on its health care for its employees annually. But let me tell you, a town of about 20,000 people spends probably a million and a half or two million bucks. So I can only imagine what Fort Worth spends tens and tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. If their health insurance company turns around and says to them, your health insurance costs will go down $2 million if you stop hiring smokers, they're going to turn around and call every school marm in the county and say, we're going to have more money for education, blah, 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 blah. It's about taxpayers' money. And then it becomes a very interesting issue. There's the liberty issue here. You know, are people free? How can you penalize people for doing something that's legal versus you're saving taxpayers money? Why should these people cost the taxpayers more money? Now, again, that argument's going to go back and forth. And I do agree with you that, again, it is legal. So how are you going to say people who choose to indulge in a legal habit? It's exactly the same thing with alcohol. I and yourself have known alcoholics that have worked on various jobs and they're working on various jobs. Alcoholics are obviously taxing the, the system as well. But alcohol is legal. And it will you know alcohol will never be made illegal again after But there's a difference there's a difference there's a difference there. Alcoholism is considered a disease. Mm -hmm. You legally I can send somebody home from work if I believe they're intoxicated. Yeah. It's very difficult to terminate somebody if they're intoxicated at work, if they can prove that they're an alcoholic. Now, right, right. if they have no medical history of it, I'll probably get away with it. But somebody who's been to treatment before and stuff like that. Oh, you can't fire them. You, absolutely. It's considered a disease. Now, right. smoking is still not considered a disease, even though it's considered an addiction. Again, you, you do, you know, there's an interesting component there. But here's another thing. You are not allowed to consume alcohol on the job. No. And in a lot but of cases. you're allowed to smoke on the job. Right. So that could be something else. They could say, sure, you can be a smoker, but you know, you're not allowed to smoke on the job. Again, there's ways that they can get around this. I know one place I worked years ago, the guy was very adamant that it was a restaurant, didn't like his waiters and waitresses, you know, smoking near doors where customers got in. So he, he looked it up. And at the time, the law was in Massachusetts. So what the most that he could do is he could tell people they had to smoke 50 feet away from the building. So they had a dumpster or something like that 50 feet away from the building, and they had to walk all the way out there in the rain or whatever and do it. So there's a lot of ways that Fort Worth can get around this if there's a challenge that it's outright illegal, which it very well may be. I don't really know. One of the things that would actually work for the city's advantage is you start talking about precedent and where liabilities or, or excuse me, where you know smoking has gone in the last 30, 40, 50 years, there's just been more and more laws, more and more restrictions on smoking. So a judge might say, hey, you know what? This has been getting more and more restrictive for 30, 40 years. This is just the trend that it's going in. Well, when I was a kid, I didn't think that smoking was ever going to disappear in my lifetime. And now I'm still, I use the word still, only in my 50s, I think smoking is going to be gone in my lifetime. And I would have never imagined that when I was a kid. You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me. And I can tell you, cities like Fort Worth, so Do I'm not sticking up for smokers. I'm just saying I'm I'm just right. playing this legal against illegal angle, you know. But you know what? Cities like Fort Worth, they start doing this in bigger and more cities are gonna start doing it, and then medium sized cities are gonna do it. Now I know yeah, unions and it's gone. I know unions have jumped in and fought this in one in some cities, but those unions are usually just the teachers' unions and like the SEIUs and stuff like that, because a lot of the police and firefighting unions a long time ago gave up on allowing their officers and everything to smoke because they realize it's not worth it, you know, for what they have to do and that they just can't have it. It's about professionalizing their profession. And, and it's about the safety of their people, really, more so than an accountant in the city of Fort Worth accountant's office. They may not be the, uh, the most active person in the world. And if they're a smoker, I don't think it's going to cause other accountants to die or, or analysts or whatever they are, transportation planners. But I think that the police and fire unions and to an extent public works unions have, have done that because they've realized having their people under the gun and unable to perform at a full level does cause some health concerns. Now, at a very personal level, I do happen to support this for the simple fact that it costs a lot of money to our health care system. It's a huge cost and we've got to start doing what we can do to recoup those costs. You want to fix a lot what's wrong with the health care in this country? Make smokers pay more every week because there's a scientific proven, and this isn't the government doing this. I don't see why private companies couldn't do this. Scientifically proven that they're going to cost more over the course of their lifetime, that there's a huge cost for smoking 
to the economy. Maybe a lot of smokers would quit if they had to pay 50 bucks extra a week for their health insurance. Maybe they wouldn't, and we'd have more money to mitigate those costs. No, because these one, are the same smokers that used to pay a dollar a pack for cigarettes, and now they're paying ten dollars a pack for cigarettes. Exactly. You know Even what? that cost didn't get them to quit. Right, but you know what? We'd be making more money with it. And mm -hmm. I know that sounds awful, but you're eventually just going to tax it and cost it out of existence to the point where people aren't going to want us to do it anymore, and they're not going to want to pick it up anymore. I think I read recently, is it 25 or 20 percent of U.S. adults smoke? 50 or 60 years ago, that was like 50 or 60 percent. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it's dropped precipitously. And, and, you know, I even remember as a little kid, and I'm in my late 20s, I remember as a little kid going to church with my grandparents, and you'd always go downstairs to, you know, drop off some bread or something before you go up to Mass. And there'd be a bunch of the older guys sitting in the kitchen in the church, and they'd all be sitting in the kitchen smoking. Of course. And, you know, they never went upstairs. They made the coffee, and your grandfather would always say hello to them, but he'd always go upstairs with, with us to Mass. Oh, people smoked everywhere, never mind bars, which you mentioned earlier, or restaurants, but movie theaters. You well, know, I, they uh, you used to be able to smoke all in the theater. Then they narrowed it down to the balcony in theaters that had balconies and or it would be the last row or two in the rear of the movie theaters. Yeah, I mean, even the, I, I think the last time I was on a plane in the last three, four years, it still had the, you could tell where they used to have the little ashtray in it. So, I mean, it, it's yeah. we're adjusting to it. <clears throat> I'll tell a brief funny story. I was in New Jersey about four or five years ago. I was actually in Philadelphia or, or Pennsylvania, I should say, right near New Jersey. We had stopped at a mall that was right over the line in New Jersey. I was with a, there at a conference, and I stopped in to a rock bottom, which they used to be some of the Massachusetts area, and they've all died out now. But we went to have a drink, and we didn't sit at the bar. We sat at a table on the side of the bar because I prefer to sit across from somebody than next to them. All of a sudden, I start smelling smoke. And again, uh, we record our studios here in Arlington, Massachusetts, and I've lived in Massachusetts my, uh, my entire adult life. When I was a kid, I remember what it was like to be somewhere where smoking was allowed, but it's been a long time. My senior prom, actually, I remember not in the main dining area and the dance area, but right outside that in sort of a waiting area, whatever you want to call it, people could still smoke outside. So this has really only been about 10 years in Massachusetts. But anyway, this is four or five years ago, and I'm smelling smoke, and I'm like, am I standing near a door and there are people smoking outside or something? And I look over down at the bar, and I see somebody smoking at the bar. And my first reaction was, oh, my God, they're smoking indoors. They can't do that. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, Is, isn't somebody going to say something? And then I look around, and I see somebody else smoking. I'm like, oh, it's legal yeah. here. I, mean, I, I would oh. venture to say almost most cities have not banned it. But um, I found that very interesting. But again, going back to it, I do have a personal crusade against it, and that's why I have no problem charging people more or, or whatever. I think you're right. I think it probably will eventually be made illegal. Mm -hmm. There'll probably be some national big, huge sales tax or something where insurance companies are going to say, well, we want to charge smokers. There'll be something like that. And after that, you'll see a drop off in it. Because, I mean, you are seeing it less and less. It might be that somebody just passes a law that says, you know, from now on, there's an additional X dollar tax pack. And, you know, smoking is or, or this Fort Worth thing, you'll see it take off. And pretty soon, every city, town, state, county, regional, government, council, whatever, they're all going to be smoke-free, and all their employees aren't going to be allowed to be smokers, and all their contractors aren't going to allow to hire smokers. Oh, it's headed in that direction. Right, and I think, you know, private sector companies are going to get onto it, and it's going to go to being just sort of a, a dirty habit. One thing I find interesting about smoking, and you can look these numbers up, as a percentage of the population that smokes, it's higher among wealthy people. And it's higher among and teenage girls, well, teenage girls, but in, in people on the lower end of the economic spectrum. And I always found that very interesting. People, young teens especially, but when they come from much wealthier families or when they come from, you know, your, your working class families, there's a higher propensity to smoke in those two areas. And I always found that very interesting, that it seems to be something that the rich and the poor, so to speak, share more so than the middle class. Very, very interesting. I'd love somebody to do a study on that and find out why, why that is. Maybe the rich are pretending they're poor and the poor are pretending they're rich or... You know, maybe the rich can afford the health care and the poor just don't know better. That sounds awful, so I apologize to anyone out there who's offended by that statement. And I rarely apologize for it. But well, yet the poor are paying ten dollars a pack for cigarettes. I don't know. I don't Yeah. Care. No, I, I don't really get it either. I mean, I guess I remember the their last story on this. A lady that used to work for me says, This is going back almost ten years, but she goes, Oh, you know, when cigarettes went up to a quarter, I said I was gonna stop smoking. Yeah. And when they went up to fifty cents a pack, I said I'd stop smoking. And then when I, they went up to a dollar pack, I said, I got to stop smoking. And then she just, I think, still was a smoker. And I think she's mm -hmm. dead now. But anyway, moving on, that's our in the news section for you today. Just some of the stuff that's going on. We'll have an international article in just a moment. We're going to go to a brief, brief election update. All I'm going to say about the election is this to keep your appetites whetted for the and, next And uh, because we miss it. We've been doing it for so many weeks. We exactly. Miss it. I'm like, we're not going to talk about the election. Polls are coming out. And we always encourage you here, don't really pay much attention to them. 
because depending on what website you click on, depending on what article for the website, Obama's up four, Romney's up five, Romney's down two, Obama's up three, Obama's down six. Until one of these polls shows 80-20, it's not a set election. Looking forward to the debates. I'm looking forward to seeing Obama and Romney debate. I think they're going to do well against each other. I predicted this over a year ago that they both want to go against each other because healthcare becomes less of an issue. If the Supreme Court prior to the debates strikes down Obamacare, we're not going to get into a debate over whether they will or not, although that'd be a great episode, a great idea for a future episode. I think if it gets struck down, Romney will be happy because he won't have to talk about health care because Obama is not going to want to talk about health care. It's going to be a mm -hmm. riot that you could have three or four presidential debates where health care doesn't come up because no, neither of them remotely <laughs> want to talk, talk about it. Right. Um, I also I had a note here on October surprises. I'm going to go ahead and make a viewpoint prediction that there won't be any October surprises. I don't think that Obama is going to swap Biden for Hillary or anything like that. I had initially thought it was a possibility. I at this point just don't think it's going to happen. I could be wrong. But politicians tend to not be as interesting and energetic. I don't think anything's going to happen. There's also a very practical element of the time to get on the ballot and switch stuff like that is becoming very limited. And yeah, they could point Hillary and all this other stuff. I just, I don't think it's going to happen. I'm predicting no October surprises. No, I, I think that Obama is running cocky right now. And he or his campaign are looking at some of these polls. I CNN just released a um, latest poll a day or two ago. And it's 52 to 43 in favor of Obama percent. And the Obama campaign is just getting cocky looking at these numbers. And a lot of your Democratic political talking heads that you'll see on mainstream media are starting to warn the Democrats already saying, hey, look, just like what you're saying, don't be yeah. putting so much faith into these polls here starting with this cocky attitude that's how you're going to end up losing the election right the, you know the, the democratic pundits are saying that because you know? a, a gallup poll from today from tuesday april 17th put romney up five or six over obama right. now here's the thing right. if gallup rcp real clear rasmussen fox cnn cbn uh, cba whatever if every single poll had obama 68 to romney 21 Okay, yeah. get cocky. You're going to win. Yeah. Until they show that, you're right. I think they are. And his fundraising numbers are not very high either. So in, right. in far be it for me to agree with the Democratic strategist, I'd be careful, President Obama, because these are not the kind of numbers that win, not to mention, and although the Democrats have an electoral advantage primarily because of California, you've got to look at a lot of these polls. And again, I don't want to get too much into it, but is it a national poll? What's going to happen in the states that count? You know, What's going to happen in your Ohio's, your Pennsylvania's, your Florida's and stuff? That's where it's really going to matter. The, you know, and I know we often make the argument that, you know, and Ed, you're favor in favor of abolishing the electoral system. One of the problems, California is a massive state with nearly 60 million people. So Obama could be ahead nationally simply for the fact that he's going to win California handily and lose a whole lot of other states. We're not going to get into that debate over the electoral system now, but that's another thing to recognize is that California is by and far in favor of Obama, and it is a very, very big state. The swing of voters for Obama over Romney in California could total more than several other states. What can you do? California is a giant. Nothing you can mm -hmm. do about it. Again, I don't think there'll be any October surprises no. of that variety, of, of switching somebody out last minute or anything like that, or Romney dumping his VP or Romney, nothing like that. You never know what kind of scandals and stuff like that break, but no engineered uh, October surprises. Before we go into our news from around the world, I'm going to bring up a new little element, a new segment here on Viewpoint our non-issue of the day. And this was a news article titled, Dems hit Romney on late tax filing. Here's why this is a non-issue. It took me about 25 minutes to do my very simple taxes. Put in my little income, used my TurboTax, didn't really have many deductions, didn't make much money, end of the day. Mitt Romney's worth a couple hundred million dollars. A tax return for somebody with that much money, that many assets, is a very big, complicated thing to do. Let me put this in perspective. He's probably going to pay more to have his tax return done than most the average person makes in a year. It's a complicated process for somebody who's that wealthy. So you know what? It's just a not issue. Stop being stupid, people on the left. Moving on after my slight there. News from around the world. This coming from Toronto. Bunny Ranch facing opposition in Toronto. Political, and it's funny that we mentioned, and I didn't want to spoil the surprise, but 
we talked about prostitution earlier and you mentioned Las Vegas. It says political powers see a bunny ranch in Toronto as more of a varmint than a fluffy revenue stream. Mm -hmm. You got to love the Canadians in their writing. But it says Councillor Josh Matlow tweeted Tuesday he won't be supporting a proposal to build a brothel in the city after the Toronto, Toronto Sun ran a story about Nevada Bordello King Dennis Hoff looking to expand to Toronto. And it says that the Bunny Ranch's owner was interested in Toronto. It was sparked by a Court of Appeals decision in Ontario that hookers, and they use the word hookers in the article here, should be allowed to hire bodyguards and work openly in brothels. The advocate, rather than immediately advocating, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna... So basically a court note to Ontario said that prostitutes should be able to hire bodyguards and work openly because they're doing the work and yada, yada, yada. I know Montreal, for instance, and most of the province of Quebec, they're very liberal. They, 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 it's not quite as open as it is in, say, Amsterdam, but a lot of their strip clubs, for instance, allow touching, which a lot of clubs in this country don't. So it's very, very different than it is here. But I found it interesting that the Canadians in a very liberal country are sort of pushing back and saying, well, I don't think we want a bunny ranch here. They may not be able to stop the guy from building him. There's an article here at all. Part of the article, it also says casinos and brothels don't contribute to the city we want to build. They exploit our most vulnerable. I don't necessarily think that's true. I've personally never visited the Bunny Ranch, but I watched a series on HBO on it once that I thought was a documentary, and I may have gotten conned into watching a softcore porn movie because <laughs> I legitimately thought. But I mean, it's like six or seven hundred dollars per visit, if you want to say, if you want to call it that. So I, I mean, if they're talking Big about money. back alley brothels and stuff like that, yeah, that's awful. But they're talking about proper regulated stuff like the Bunny Ranch. I think there's good money and good money for those girls. Please no angry emails to BaseNet and to Viewpoint about how I'm a jerk and I'm a womanizer and all this. I'm just saying, based on a documentary I saw that may have actually been a well-disguised softcore porn, I think that's the, uh, that's the case there. Now, we've completed our In the News section. You have all been waiting for our full disclosure editorial. Oh, which we've I been waiting weeks for this. I'm going to explain the full disclosure editorial is just that. It's a verbal editorial, which in full disclosure is completely an ideological rant doesn't need to be fact-based. It's just really what gets me angry and what I want the world to know about. It's kind of like a what grinds my gears. We're going to talk about two things. You're getting a twofer here because of, I'm, I'm just so angry about so much that's going on out there in the world right now. The first one is welfare recipients getting drug tested. Here's what bothers me about this. Do I have a problem with welfare recipients getting drug tested? No, I think everyone should get drug tested. But what pisses me off, dirty friggin' politicians who pass these laws who aren't drug tested themselves. How dare you as a politician at the federal, state, or local level pass this law when you yourself probably aren't drug tested, especially at the local level, they're never done, rarely at the state level. What about your little staffers? How many of those congressional staffers, how many of those state legislative staffers out there are sitting there and, you know, blowing lines of coke off their desk or taking a couple extra perks or whatever it is they want to do. And you're passing laws saying that these welfare recipients should have to take a, take a drug test. Screw you, dirty politicians in this country. Go get yourself drug tested before you try drug testing other people. What's the difference between a politician getting a $70,000 paycheck from the state and a welfare recipient getting a $12,000 paycheck for the cha from the state? I'll tell you what, the welfare recipient friggin' deserves it, and they've probably earned it because chances are their life is in a shitty place to begin with. So screw you to all these politicians out there who are not drug tested. And all your little staff members and your lackeys and your appointees, screw you. Drug test yourself and them first, and then go after these friggin' people who are on welfare. Is there a lot of fraud in the system? Is there a lot of abuse? Yes, we need to get rid of that. Yes, we need to fix that. But I'm sorry. Make sure you're a drug fee first before you start putting these people on welfare, uh, uh, you know, onto drug tests. Look at people like Anthony Weiner sending naked pictures of himself to random friggin' women. These people that are politicians, you're not any better than these welfare recipients. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to go one step further and say that the average person on some kind of welfare, state assistance, TANF, whatever it is, is better than the average politician. Because at least they're in a shitty position and they admit it and they're getting a, step, a stipend from the state to help them get through. Whereas you're just suckling at the teat of the American taxpayer screwing up and doing nothing and driving my country into the ground. Let me tell you something. Welfare recipients did not cause this friggin' recession. Welfare recipients are not responsible for the national debt. Welfare recipients are a product of and not a cause of a failed degenerate education system in this country. Every problem we face has not been caused by welfare recipients. It has been caused by stupid 
dirty, underhanded politicians. And I hope every last one of you goes to hell in Georgia, the Republicans that voted for this, because it's Republicans like you that give the entire Republican Party a bad name. Get yourselves drug tested first. Get your staffs. Get your dirty, cheap, dime store whore wives drug tested before you start drug testing welfare recipients. Why don't we pick on the top people in the country before we pick on the people in the bottom? And I know that sounds like a far left liberal thing for me to say, but let's get something straight here in this country. The problem is not the people on the bottom. The problem is the people at the top and it's the politicians. Drug test them first before anything else. So screw you Republicans in Georgia. I'm gonna go one step further. further. The Georgia state legislature, the Republican party in the state of Georgia, I should say, is officially getting de-endorsed. Screw you, you're out of here. Too many dirty politicians in this country. Let's attack the politicians before we attack the people, because they're the problems of all. They're the cause of all the problems in this country. Politicians on both sides of the article, not the stupid welfare people, not the stupid rich people at the top, not the morons on the middle. It's the politicians. It always has been, and it always will be. And it's time we wake up and realize that. That's editorial number one. Number two, a moronic stupid state representative, excuse me, uh, a congressman in Michigan submitted a bill and I got an email today from moveon.org about it to begin forgiving student loan debt. Let me explain something to you, ladies and gentlemen. In the city of Angels, Los Angeles, California, almost half of the idiots that go to school there do not graduate from high school. Fact number one. Fact number two. How many black kids have been shot in Chicago in the southwest, uh, south eastern part of Chicago this year? The answer is over 100. Do you know how many are going to get shot by the end of the year? A couple hundred. Do you know how many kids are going to get shot by the next year in Chicago? Poor black kids in the ghetto? The answer, a couple hundred. And the year after that, and the year after that, and the year after that. Like it's been going on for the last 30 or 40 years. Fact number three, kids are going to die from middle class and upper middle class families in Massachusetts this year from opiate overdoses. It is an epidemic that is ruining our country and kids are gonna die from it. That's a fact. Here's another fact. We have veterans coming back without arms, without legs, without all sorts of other stuff. They're having trouble finding jobs. They're having trouble paying their bills. They're over there doing our dirty work and I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming our dirty politicians for not giving them a clear mission. They're gonna come home and they're finding a shitty country, tough job opportunities. They don't have limbs, they don't have, so whatever it is, okay? So the bottom line that I'm trying to get across here is that our country has real problems and it has real people suffering, real actual human suffering going on in this country. And I'm supposed to agree to spend taxpayer money because some douchebag went to school and got a $150,000 degree in Russian studies or in film or in political theory. And I'm supposed to pay that off because you can't find a good job Screw you. When did the people on the left at moveon.org start becoming about the overeducated upper middle class kids who went to college? Because I'm sorry, if you're dirt poor in this country, you're going to go to college for free. You can get screwed if you're in that lower middle class bracket where you end up having to pay a lot more. But I'm sorry, you made a decision. You borrowed money. Pay your friggin debts like a normal human being, like a decent person, because I can't stand the fact that we would give a single dollar to wipe out some dumb college kid's debt so that they can go continue playing around when we have kids getting shot to death in Chicago and in DC and every other city in this country, kids dying of overdoses. The city of Los Angeles can't get half of their miserable students to even graduate high school when all you gotta do is friggin' show up most of the time. You have senior citizens living in these degenerate, disgusting senior housing institutions, whatever it is you put them in these, these state-run homes, and it's disgusting, and they reek like piss. And you've got all these people living in, in, in subsidized housing. This country has so much human suffering going on. They say one in six or one in seven kids goes to bed at night hungry. We have starving children in this country, and I'm supposed to forgive your student loan debt? For what? For what? Screw you. Give it to people that are suffering. Give it to the veterans. Give it to kids that need it. How dare you think that we should forgive your student loan debt while people in this country are suffering? Because you know what? We could use that money to alleviate their suffering, but we're not going to use it to pay off your student loan debt so you can go fly around the world, buy a condo in downtown Manhattan, or do whatever it is you douchebags do with your worthless college degrees. I'm sorry, if you really think the federal government in the condition we're in should spend taxpayer money to pay off your debt 
with all the suffering that goes on in this country, I'm sorry, you're an asshole. And there's no other way to describe it. You're a disgusting, degenerate human being. You are the worst of the worst. You are worse than the most conservative Republican and worse than the most liberal Democrat. I don't know what you are other than a scumbag that you want your loans paid off for your bullshit degree that does nothing for this country and does nothing for you with all the suffering that we have going on. Disgusting. And that Boy, was, I missed the full disclosure portion oh, of this show. I, th that one's been building up in me for a while. <laughs> I'm, glad I, I'm glad I got that out. But that was our full disclosure editorial, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it. In full disclosure, that's my own editorial. We're going to move on to close our broadcast with something as we usually do after the edit full disclosure editorial on the lighter side. And I've got two of these as well. The first one, I tried the new Doritos taco. And I must say I enjoyed it. Now, I only got one because I just wanted to try it, and I am trying to watch what I eat. But I wouldn't want, if I normally go to Taco Bell, I'll officially endorse Taco Bell. I mean, it'd be great if they could throw us some money here, but they did a good job with this. Doritos, too. You know, normally you get two or three tacos. I don't think I'd want all three tacos to be a Dorito taco, okay. but I definitely want one of them to be a Dorito taco. I, I wouldn't feel right having three tacos without one of them being a Dorito taco. Hmm. So good work. Good work on that, Taco Bell. I like that. You're, you're thinking outside the bun. <laughs> My second on the lighter note is those of you who have Netflix out there, and if you don't, it's eight bucks a month. Just go pay for it. There's a series, and it's a Netflix-owned series called Lilyhammer with Steven Van Zandt, who most recently was uh, played Silvio in The Sopranos and is also a member of Bruce Springsteen's, Bruce Springsteen's band. And he, he's, he's a mobster who sort of escapes to Norway in the Witness Protection Program. There's, the show is partially in Norwegian with subtitles, although all of his lines are in English. Netflix describes the show as quirky, and I'd have to say that's the perfect word to describe it. I recently finished watching all eight episodes of the first season, and I really enjoyed it. I might go back and watch it a second time. And I'm not a big TV person. I, I mean, I have my Netflix mainly for downtime, but I, I usually don't go home at night. I don't have my shows. I, I don't watch all that much TV. But I really enjoyed the, the, the series Lilyhammer, so I highly, highly recommend if you have Netflix, go on, start watching Lilyhammer. If you do not have Netflix, go buy Netflix. You could probably pay the eight bucks and watch all eight episodes, and you'll get seven or eight hours of entertainment, so it's worth it. And then cancel the Netflix, or if they give you a free trial, do that just to watch Netflix, just to watch the Lilyhammer show, because I highly, highly recommend it. And with that, I'm going to close out our broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to once again remind, thank you for listening, of course, first and foremost. Remind you to find us anywhere on the social media that is out there as BaseNetTV.com. Uh, sorry, just BaseNetTV. Remember, we're on Google+. Plus, We're on Facebook. We're on, we're on the Twitter. We're on Tony Book coming soon. We're out there, so find us. You can always email us at viewpoint at BaseNetTV.com. Comments, concerns, suggestions, complaints. You want Res to Resumes for co-hosts. Resumes for co-hosts. Go ahead and set it in. Or guest spots. We'll do either. You can always find all of our information and all of our other lovely BaseNet television programming at BaseNetTV.com. Once again, BaseNetTV.com. And last but not least, I will remind you, it is very important. We do need donations to keep this station running, to keep the programming up, to pay the rent on our Arlington studios. And the donation tab, if you go onto our homepage, BaseNetTV.com, and you donate now through the first week of, do of June, we're going to give 20% of all donations to the Jimmy Fund which is a great, great doesn't cause. Doesn't get any Remember, better than that. Doesn't get any better than that. Remember, a little in abundance is a lot. And with that, I will leave you folks to your day. Thank you for enjoying this BaseNet TV production. Thank you for listening to Viewpoint. I am the BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent, Tony Mizuko, signing off. Mm -hmm.